Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. This is week two, Noah, which covers Genesis 6, 9 through 11, 32. Lots to talk about. Noah, the flood, the ark, the corruption of DNA and corruption of everything upon the earth, uh, the covenant, genealogies, Nimrod, the Tower of Babel, and our introduction to Abraham. So with that being said, let's start with prayer and get right into it. Heavenly Father, Most High, Yahuwah, we just, we present ourselves before you and bless you in Yahushua's mighty name, your son that you sent for us, that we may have life everlasting and forgiveness of sins. Father, we just ask that you would open our eyes and our ears as we begin to study your word today and that you would help give us understanding that we may be faithful hearers and doers. We bless you, give you all glory, all praise and all honor as it is due and fitting to you. In Messiah Yahushua's name we pray, amen, hallelujah, and Shabbat Shalom. Here we are, best day of the week. So let's get started with a shofar blast and we'll get right into Genesis 6-9. Okay, here we are at Genesis 6-9, and let's get into it. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with Elohim. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. So let's stop there. And quite frankly, we're going to speak quite a bit about this because this is so important. This is really uh, continuing on continuing on some of the things we talked about last week about how the angels, the watchers, the sons of Elohim, the Benai Elohim came down and mated with women. And through that, they created these giants. It also says they also uh, sinned against uh, birds and reptiles and fish and all sorts of things. And so the DNA, all the DNA was corrupted because it wasn't both supposed to be mixed this way. So we can only imagine that if angel mates with a woman and creates these human giants, well, what happens if an angel mated with reptiles or fish or birds what kind of giant creatures would be created through these things? And so this is just my opinion, but this is how I understand, um, well, dinosaurs, which we talked about last week, which is really the, the mainstream pushes so much for children and, and really and, and adults alike to love and, en and embrace. It's all over uh, T-shirts. It's all over Hollywood. It's just pushed out there so much that it really makes me believe that that uh, Satan is is putting forth these corrupted creatures that were really created by him and his fallen angels for men and women to and children to love and to and to enjoy. And so um, let's start there. So really, this is what this passage is talking about is it says first that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And Noah walked with Elohim. And then here it says, And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. Um, the earth was filled with violence, and the earth was corrupt. And so I truly believe that that 
nature had been corrupted through this unlawful mixing of DNA, angel DNA with uh, with people and angel DNA with animals, creating these creatures. And what we found, what we saw in the Book of Enoch last week, and we'll kind of just we'll we'll touch base on it and read it again. Actually, we'll just do that right, right now, just to refresh our memories of what's actually going on here. And this is Enoch seven, and it says, and all the others together with them took unto themselves wives. And this is talking about the sons of Elohim. Just to actually just to show you. Um, this is talking about here. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said, Come, uh, said one to another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget children. And we learn here in a bit that they... Um, um, that they created these giants. But so, and all together, and all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 L's who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. So you have this corrupted DNA, corrupted creature, that has human and angel DNA mix. And when that happens, this giant creature uh, was was birthed. And they ate all the acquisitions of men. So I would assume they ate all their crops and probably livestock, animals, those kind of things. And when the food ran out, they're like, well, we're going to eat you now. So you'd ask yourself, well, what would happen if, if uh, these angels also mated with animals? You would assume that they would corrupt their way as well. They'd probably start eating people too. And that's why I believe that, um, you know, these dinosaurs, whatever you want to call them, were eating people, and the whole all the corruption was just destroying itself. And you know, so, so, and it says here, then they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. And then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. So, whether it was literally the angels that mixed uh, DNA with these uh, animals, or even the giants themselves that had this angel DNA mixed with them, either way, something mated with these um, animals. And corrupted the corrupted their way, and so this is that corruption that was upon the earth. And as another witness, the book of Jasher here, chapter four, book of Jasher was mentioned in the Bible two times. It says this is chapter four, verse eighteen. It says, and their judges and their rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other, in order therewith to provoke Yahweh and. Elohim saw the whole earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth, all men and all animals. And Yahweh said, I will blot man uh, that I created from the face of the earth. Yea, from man to the birds of the air, together with the cattle and the beasts that are in the field, I repent that I have made them. So everything was basically just corrupted. And, you know, this is this is something that's um, we really got to take a look at today. It says uh, in Luke 17, 26 through 32. And the reason I want to spend a little bit of time, extra time on this topic about the corruption of DNA is because it says this. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. And he goes on to explain here. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage. So all oh, life is just going on as normal. And then boom, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. <coughs> Excuse me. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he. Uh, so, so anyways, let's stop right there. So we see that life is just going on like normal, no big deal. And that's how we see today. People have no problem um, not only not following the Most High, but mocking his ways and doing things just to provoke. As we saw here in the book of Jasher, it says that um, they did these things in order to provoke Yah. And if you look around at society and what's going on, are there people that purposefully provoke him? They're like, yeah, you don't exist. I'll do whatever I want. I'll rebel. I'll be haughty. I'll be <clears throat> boastful. I'll be prideful. Do whatever I want. Same thing's going on today. But when it says here, as it was in the days of Noah, I really wanted to dig into this Torah portion and 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 really talk about what it was like in the days of Noah. And so we begin, we were beginning to talk about that, how <clears throat> there was giants on the earth, and I do believe there were giant animals on the earth, which is what people call dinosaurs. 
and uh, you have this mixing of DNA. And so here's a <clears throat> article from BBC. It says the uneasy truth about human animal hybrids. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole article for you, but they they really just go and justify and say, ah, oh, these things are just myths. It's not a big deal. Uh, there's no problem with doing these things. Um, you know, this is done. It's been done before or it's you know, not a big deal. And then they go on to say <clears throat> mules have uh, you talking about mules and which is which is kind of interesting because we do see mules in the Bible, which is a mixture of um, uh, was it a mixture of a donkey and um and uh, a horse and so we have to understand i guess that there is some allowance of some sort of mixture um and we look at like when we look at dogs i mean you have the different breeds of dogs mixing together does that make them an abomination i would say no but when you have the the mixture of like humans and, and animals and um all sorts of different things we have this uh, we have a real big problem and uh the reason i want to bring this up <clears throat> is because something really interesting uh, has come about something called the EnviroPig, and this has been around a couple of years, so some of you have already probably already heard about this, but the uh, EnviroPig is something really interesting here. It's a, I'll just read a couple uh, passages here for you, or a couple, let's see, it says, uh, is it a pig or a mouse? This is the EnviroPig. It says, relax, I am told, it's just a bit of DNA and not species-specific. Putting mouse DNA into a pig won't affect it at all. Why then are researchers trying to bring a little piggy to the market with mouse DNA spliced into the beast? The answer is simple and readily answered by people behind it because the mouse DNA, when combined with E. coli, allows for the pig to process phosphorus in a way that the pig currently cannot. So really, they're just trying to change uh, the most highest creation. And I find that really interesting because there's a passage in Isaiah 66, 17 that says this, They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. So, you know, is that coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. I find it really interesting that that's one of the major... Um, animal gene splicing things they're 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 talking about here but also in this article and, and many other articles you can research it for yourself um it's right here so harvesting organs uh, from humans conjures a, a version of a dystopian future but they're basically saying that you know now they're starting to bioengineer pigs to start uh engineering um replacement organs for people and so they're they're creating these hybrids of pigs to start um, harvesting kidneys and hearts and different types of things and so you know are we in the days of noah possibly can it get much worse than this maybe are there much worse things going on behind the scenes that we're not familiar with are they already um, mixing human and animal dna together maybe i don't know all i'm saying is that the the signs are here that we are in the days of noah it, it, like I said, it could get much, much worse than what we've seen here, but we're starting to see the same pattern of how flesh is corrupting its way. And so it says, And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And so, um, in, in really in two major ways, uh, we're starting to see this splicing of, of DNA. Uh, and you know, some people have, have talked about um, there's there's a certain thing that they were sticking in people's arms that may or may not have are, are changing people's DNA. I'm not too familiar with that or not too sure about that. That's not really my um, uh, an area of research that I spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, that's very possible. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, um, you know. <clears throat> but also just thinking about mankind in general that have corrupted its way just leaving the most high and his, and his ordinances uh, is, is really um, really something to take a look at and the earth is filled with violence and uh, well really the earth has been filled with violence for a long time um, especially looking at the the, the three world or the, the two world wars um, the major conflicts that have been going on and uh, really the, the third world war I think is is something we've been in for a while uh, I believe the third world war is a war that's fought in a much different front <clears throat> we see that that war against uh, mankind in general, I think, is fought through uh, misinformation, um, through the, the education system, which has co completely been corrupting the minds of the youth, putting their brains in a cage, per se, since day one. Um, really uh, looking at uh, modern day medicine with the, the, the pharmacia that pe they, they attempt to heal people with, but create so many more problems, um, drugs, and, and just you know, Hollywood and so many different, I believe World War Three is fought in a much different front. You know, are there going to be, is there going to be a war with uh, multiple countries all fighting each other? Well, yeah, but I, I believe so. But I, I believe that there's a, a much greater war that's been going on for, um, 
quite some time now, the last 100, 150 years or so, their plans, the plans of the, the hidden hand has really been made manifest in these last uh, couple generations. So um, anyways, so, <clears throat> but it says here that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And so this is something that I, I really, I learned from Rob Skiba many years ago is that there's really two different things here is Noah was a just man. So he was righteous and then, and he was perfect in his generations. So kind of denoting that his, his, um, his flesh, his body was not corrupted by these corruptions that were gone. So there was no mixture of DNA. There was no corruption, I believe, in his body. So he was more of a, a perfect, um, perfect man in both actions and literally in his flesh. And that's why I believe Elohim uh, chose him to repopulate the whole earth. Because if all flesh had corrupted its way, well, the only way to do that is to, well, a reset, a restart, if you will. This is uh, from the book of Enoch. This is Enoch 106. And this is the birth of, of, uh, of Noah. Because, again, what we're talking about here is Noah being perfect in his generations or even maybe even perfect in his body or his flesh, if you will. And after some days, my son Methuselah took a wife for his son Lamech, and she became pregnant by him and bore a son. And his body was white as snow and red as the blooming of a rose. And the hair of his head and his long locks were white as wool, and his eyes beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, he lighted up the whole house like the sun. And the whole house was very bright. Let me, since it's so bright, let me put my glasses on. And thereupon he arose in the hands of the midwife and opened his mouth and conversed with Yahuwah of righteousness. And his father Lamech was afraid of him and fled and came to his father Methuselah. And he said to him, I've begotten a strange son, diverse from an unlike man and resembling the sons of Elohim of heaven. So resembling the angels and his nature is different and he is not like us and his eyes are as the rays of the sun and his countenance is glorious. And it seems to me that he has not sprung from me, but from the angels. And I fear that in his days, a wonder may be wrought on the earth. And now my father, I am here to petition you and to implore you that you may go to Enoch, our father and learn from him the truth. For his dwelling place is amongst the angels. And when Methuselah heard the words of his son, he came to me to the ends of the earth, for he had heard that I was there. And he cried aloud, and I heard his voice, and I came to him. And I said to him, Behold, here am I, my son. Why have you come to me? And he answered and said, Because of a great cause of anxiety I have come to you, and because of a disturbing vision have I approached. And now, my father, hear me. Unto Lamech, my son, there has been born a son, the like of whom there is none, and his nature is not like man's nature, and the color of his body is whiter than snow and redder than the bloom of a rose, and the hair of his head is whiter than wool, and his eyes are like the rays of the sun, and he opened his eyes and thereupon lighted up the whole house, and he arose in the hands of the midwife and opened his mouth and blessed Yahweh of heaven, and his father Lamech became afraid and fled to me. And did not believe that he was sprung from him, but that he was in the likeness of the angels of heaven. And behold, I have come to you that you may make known to me the truth. And I, Enoch, answered and said unto him, Yahweh will do a new thing on the earth. So he's making something new. And this I have already seen in a vision and make known to you that in the generation of my father, Jared, some of the angels of heaven transgressed the word of Yahuwah. And behold, they commit sin and transgress the law and have united themselves with women and commit sin with them and have married some of them and have begot children by them. And they shall produce on the earth giants, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. And there shall be a great punishment on the earth and the earth shall be cleansed from all impurity. Yea, there shall come a great destruction over the whole earth and there shall be a deluge and a great destruction for one year. And this son who has been born unto you shall be left on the earth. And his three children shall be saved with him when all mankind that are on the earth shall die. And he and his son shall be saved. And now make known to your son Lamech that he who has been born is in truth his son. And call his name Noah, for he shall be left to you. And he and his sons shall be saved from the destruction which shall come upon the earth on account of all the sin and all the unrighteousness which shall be cons consummated on the earth in his days. And after that, there shall still be more unrighteousness than that which was first consummated on the earth. For I know the mysteries of the holy ones. For he, Yahuwah, has showed me and informed me, and I have read them in the heavenly tablets. So also I want to read for you um, 
the writings of Abraham. Let's go to page, let's see where we're at here. Well, let's see. <clears throat> the writings of Abraham. We're going to go to page 48 here. And I have links for all this. So if you're interested in reading more or if I'm going too fast or want to go back to some of the things I mentioned, uh, there should be a, a link in the description box for the, um, the study guide. Writings of Abraham. These things were a source of amazement and concern unto Lamech, who thereupon went unto his father Methuselah, and finding him in the temple, he said, My father, this day did my wife, uh, your daughter, bear a man-child. And at his birth, the room was full of light so that we could not look upon him. And when we could not look upon him, behold, the child's hair was white. Or I'm sorry, when we could look upon him, behold, the child's hair was white and fire seemed to come from his eyes. And then he stood upon his feet and sang a hymn of praise unto Yahuwah. And lo, he seemed to have the tongue of an angel. Tell me now the meaning of these things and how can I raise such a son? Hearing these words, Methuselah too was troubled and said, Fear not, my son, for although I know now the meaning of these things, I will go unto my father Enoch, for he is privy to the angels, and he will be able to explain things to us. Whereupon Methuselah traveled to the top of the highest mountain, whence he could speak unto his father, Enoch, and said unto him, My father, my daughter, who is the wife of my son Lamech, has this day brought forth a man-child. And at his birth, the room was full of light so that they could not look upon him. And when they could look upon him, behold, the child's hair was white and fire seemed to come from his eyes. And then he stood upon his feet and sang a hymn of praise unto Yahuwah. And lo, he seemed to have the tongue of an angel. Thus saith my son Lamech, who is greatly perplexed as to the meaning of these things, and how can he raise such a son? Hearing this report, Enoch comforted his son Methuselah, saying, Fear not, my son, nor fret yourself about this manner. <clears throat> For did not a holy angel visit your son Lamech and tell him that this should be the seed of the angels? And was it not so? For this cause have these things happened. But on the eighth day, when the child is circumcised, he shall be covered and shall appear as other men, except that his hair shall remain white as a token that through him Yahweh will do a mighty work. This word did Methuselah return to his son Lamech, and he was comforted. So, Something interesting, a little, little different twist, but very, uh, very uh, a similar understanding here of what's going on. So let's keep reading. So I, I, hopefully that gives you a better understanding of what it was like in the days of Noah and why, really, why the the flood had to come. Because some people would be like, "Oh, you want to serve the you want to serve the God that destroyed everything, you know, by water by a flood." And I say, "Yes, I do." Why? Because all I mean, what put yourself in that situation? What what? Think about that for a second. You're 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 in those days, and there's giants roaming around. They're eating people. Uh, there's there's these giant animals that are ferocious and eating people and destroying everything. And everything's just all corrupt. Everything's just destroying each other. Every the earth was filled with violence. So everybody was violent and and threatening. And uh, I mean, how would that how would that seem to you? The Most High destroyed it and reset. So back to Genesis 6, verse 13. We're going to move on now. And Elohim said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make you an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall you make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. This this word pitch is really interesting. I'm going to pull it up real quickly. Uh, I learned this through Sister Ashira uh, last year. But the word is kafar, and this uh, this word is also used for atonement, for purging, for reconciliation, for forgiveness. So the ark was was uh, covered with atonement, with forgiveness. Pretty interesting. It's the same root word we get from like Yom Kippur for Day of Atonement. Pretty cool. Genesis six fifteen, and this is the fashion. With which you shall make of it, the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall you make to the ark, and in a cubit shall you finish it above. And the door of the ark shall you set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shall you make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is on the earth shall die. And rightly so. The judge of all rightly decreed that it should happen. What's interesting about the Ark, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with this. Um, there was a man named uh, Ron Wyatt who <clears throat> had amazing discoveries, uh, I believe, by the will of the Most High. And if you search uh, like Ron Wyatt, um, Noah's Ark, 
you should find a documentary uh, highlighting these things. Uh, we also uh, we also did a documentary a couple years ago. Um, <clears throat> I forgot what I named it. But uh, if you just search Parable of the Vineyard Documentary of Truth, it should pop up. And we highlighted this and many others. But the point is, is Ron found the Noah's Ark in the mountains of Ararat back in, uh, was it the 70s or 80s? <clears throat> but most people dismissed it because the, right here it says, the length of the Ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50, 50 cubits. And so when they found what they found, the dimensions weren't, weren't exactly right but what's interesting was what what ron looked at is there's there's a there's a generic cubit and then there's the egyptian cubit which we know moshe would have been familiar with so according to the egyptian cubit which is a little bit different size what they found in the mountains of ararat was actually exactly perfect uh and so they found uh, pieces of, of petrified timber they found uh, all sorts of fastening um screws and 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 uh uh, nails and, and things like that. So it was really amazing find. So if you haven't looked into it, uh, I find it fascinating because there's there's proof in in our natural world in the earth. There is proof, uh, you know. There's proof about the the word all throughout. You know things like Sodom and Gomorrah. So if you're interested about proving the Bible's authenticity without just blind faith and just well i've just trusted because it's the word of yah if you want to look at some some natural proof that yah has allowed to be preserved for us in these last days well i would uh, i would highly recommend you take a look at uh, the, the doc documentary we did a couple years ago again just if you go on your youtube just search uh, parable of the vineyard documentary of truth uh, i think you'll find it that way so <clears throat> Anyways, so Genesis six eighteen. But with you, so he's talking. He's going to bring the flood. Everything's going to die. But with you, will I establish my covenant? <clears throat> and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your woman and your sons' women with you. And every living thing of all flesh, to every sort, shall you bring into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. So um, apparently, there were some animals that had not been corrupted yet, and the Most High was going to bring them in, and, and he did it in a miraculous way in the Book of Jasher or Yashar. Uh, we'll find out how he actually did that because you'd think it'd be probably, probably pretty hard for Noah to go out there and find two of every single creature out there. I mean, that would be, I mean, that'd probably take hundreds of years just to find every species, but uh, you'll find that the Most High did it very supernaturally and very uh, in a very amazing way. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, to every resort shall, shall come unto you, that's the key. They ended up coming to Noah, which we'll find out, to keep them alive. And take unto you of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to you, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus did Noah according to all the Elohim commanded him, so did he. So let's uh, let's read about this real quick. Uh, so we're going to read um, <clears throat> we're going to read the book of Yashar, uh, chapter 5, verse 5 through 36. <clears throat> And so we're going to read uh, in, in um, let me preface this. Um, actually, let me just see. So Peter mentions that that um, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Second Peter 2.5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So um, Peter knew that Noah was a preacher. But what's interesting is in the book of Genesis, we don't really get anywhere where Noah was a preacher. So we have to believe that Peter was a, was familiar with that writing somewhere. And we're going we're gonna to read that right now. Book of Jasher, chapter 5, verse 5. And all who followed Yahuwah died in those days before they saw the evil which Elohim declared to do upon it. And after the lapse of many years, in the 480th year of the life of Noah, when all those men who followed Yahuwah had died away from amongst the sons of men, and only Methuselah was then left, Elohim said unto Noah and Methuselah, saying, Speak ye, and proclaim to the sons of men, saying, Thus says Yahuwah, Return from your evil ways and forsake your works, and Yahuwah will repent of the evil that he declared to do to you, so that it shall not come to pass." For thus says Yahweh, Behold, I give you a period of 120 years. If you will return to me and forsake your evil ways, then will I also turn away from the evil which I told you, and it shall not exist, says Yahuwah. And Noah and Methuselah spake all the words of Yahweh to the sons of men, day after day, constantly speaking to them. So here they're preaching. But the sons of men would not hearken to them, nor incline their ears to their words, and they were stiff-necked. Sounds familiar. 
And Yahweh granted them a period of 120 years, saying, If they will return, then will Elohim repent of the evil, so as to not destroy the earth. Noah, the son of Lamech, refrained from taking a wife in those days to beget children. For he said, Surely now Elohim will destroy the earth. Wherefore then shall I beget children? And Noah was a just man. He was perfect in his generation. And Yahweh chose him to raise up seed from his seed upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh said to Noah, Take unto you a wife, and beget children, for I have seen you righteous before me in this generation. And you shall raise up a seed and your children with you in the midst of the earth. And Noah went and took a wife, and he chose Naamah, the daughter of Enoch, and she was 580 years old. And Noah was 498 years old when he took Naamah for wife. And Naamah conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Yapheth, saying, Elohim has enlarged me in the earth. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Shem, saying, Elohim has made me a remnant to, to raise up seed in the midst of the earth. And Noah was 502 years old when Nama bare Shem. And the boys grew up and went in the ways of Yahuwah, and all that Methuselah and Noah their father taught them. And Lamech, the father of Noah, died in those days, yet verily he did not go with all his heart in the ways of his father. And he died in the hundred and ninety-fifth year of the life of Noah. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred and seventy-seven years, and he died. And all the sons of men who knew Yahuwah died in that year before Yahuwah brought evil upon them. For Yahuwah willed them to die so as not to behold the evil that Elohim would bring upon their brothers and relatives, as he had so declared to do. <clears throat> In that time, Yahweh said to Noah and Methuselah, Stand forth and proclaim to the sons of men all the words that I spoke to you in those days. Peradventure, they may turn from their evil ways. And this is the heart of the Father. He says this in Ezekiel. He's like, do I, do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked? No, but that all would turn to me. And I will then repent of the evil and will not bring it. And Noah and Methuselah stood forth and said in the ears of the sons of men all that Elohim had spoken concerning them. But the sons of men would not hearken, neither would they incline their ears to all their declarations. And it was after this that Yahweh said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me on account of their evil deeds, and behold, I will destroy the earth. And so I'm going to pause here real quickly and just really mention something. I don't know a lot of us have felt the call, the urge to share the truth with our family, our friends, our loved ones, our coworkers, acquaintances, whoever, or just the random person in the grocery store. <clears throat> or wherever. And maybe some of us have seen um, the seeds we plant grow up and, and, and people turn and repent. And maybe a lot of us have seen it's just a brick wall and there's just like, like I don't see it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to hear you. I'm going to stand fast in the ways that I have been, I've known for all of my life. And so just think about this for a second. Noah and Methuselah, righteous men, no, I mean, especially Noah. I mean, probably way more eloquent in speech and way more knowledgeable in the ways of the Most High, uh, filled with the Spirit. Well, he preached to the whole world in zero converts. And I'm not getting on Noah. I'm just saying that let's, let's think about this realistically, is that let's not get down on ourselves if we share, 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 and nobody listens. Well, <clears throat> nobody listened to a much greater man than any of us. So just something to take into consideration <clears throat> that's not to it's also not to discourage you um because we are we have been charged by our messiah matthew 20 is to, is to go forth and, and to 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 proclaim and we're all supposed to share our testimonies paul says we're supposed to be epistles to be read of all men so we are to share our testimonies and uh, even and so even if we don't have one person uh turn repent listen <clears throat> we still do our job and do you take unto you gopher wood and go to a certain place and make a large ark and place it in that spot? And thus shall you make it 300 cubits its length, 50 cubits broad, and 30 cubits high. And you shall make unto you a door open at its side, and to a cubit shall you finish it above and cover it within and without with pitch. And behold, I will bring the flood of waters upon the earth, and all flesh will be destroyed from under the heavens. All that is upon the earth shall perish. And you and your household shall go and gather two couple of all living things, male and female, and shall bring them into the ark to raise up seed from them upon the earth. And gather unto you all food that is eaten by the animals, that there may be food for you and for them. And you shall choose for your sons three maidens from the daughters of men, and they shall be wives to your sons. And Noah rose up, and he made the ark in the place where Elohim had commanded him. And Noah did as Elohim had ordered him. 
In his 595th year, Noah commenced to make the ark, and he made the ark in five years, as Yahuwah commanded. Then Noah took the three daughters of Eliakim, son of Methuselah, for wives for his sons, as Yahuwah commanded Noah. And it was at that time Methuselah, son of Enoch, died. 900 and, 960 years old was he at his death. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll stop there, and we'll read some more of Yeshar in just a bit. But let's go back to Genesis. Let's go to chapter 7. And Yahuwah said unto Noah, Come, you and all your house, into the ark, for you have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast you shall take to you by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So we here see, already see that Noah knew clean from unclean. So the law, the Torah, the Most High, had to have existed pre-Mount Sinai because, well, that's part of Torah, clean and unclean. And as we saw last week, Day one was when the light, the Torah, was created. All right, Genesis 7, 3. Of fowls also of the heirs by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to unto all that Yahweh commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his women, and his sons' women with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creeps upon the earth. So everything. But here again we see clean and unclean. And so we know that the Torah existed before Mount Sinai. We also know that through Abraham, here in Genesis 26, 5, it says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. The Hebrew word here is Torah. <clears throat> so. All right. Genesis 7, 9. There went in two and two unto El Noach into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, and the sons of Noah, and Noah's woman, and the three women of his sons with them into the ark. So eight souls. <clears throat> so earlier talking about like dinosaurs and those things, you know that the narrative they teach is that there was a um, a life and or the, it was a uh, an extinction level event. Well, there was there was an extinction level event that just destroyed all of them at one time. That's why they're not here anymore, because the Most High cleansed the earth. Think about that for a second. Also, just about the flood in general. Let's take a look at First Peter. First Peter three, which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of Elohim waited in the days of Noah, 120 years to be a fact, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like, so the like figure wherein to even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh. So it's not like a bath or a shower, but the answer of a good conscience towards Elohim by the resurrection of Yahusha HaMashiach, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of Elohim, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So Peter makes the, the, the likeness of, or the comparison of the flood and the cleansing it did with baptism. And not like a bath or a shower, but the cleansing of our ruach, the cleansing of our soul, cleansing of our mind, our conscience. Praise Yah for that. All right, back to, uh, uh, you know, I want to pause here real quickly also. Here in verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So when, we're, when we look at, like, um, what we've been taught since day one, is this is what they teach us. The layers of the earth, the inner core, the outer core, mantle, crust. Where are the fountains of the deep? in regards to this how does that work and where are the windows of heaven if this is what we're living on and this is just outer space where's the where's the where's the windows of heaven and where are the foundations of the deep where is the deep how does that even work on something like this whereas we talked about this last week whereas something like this we have here 
the firmament. And you can see here they've made the, the windows and doors of heaven. And this is where the waters above the firmament came down. So there's we learned last week that he made the firmament and separated the waters from the waters. And when he opens this window, what happens? These waters just come gushing in here. And here you have the great deep. And with the great deep, you have the fount the fountains of the great deep. So water not only came from here, but also water came from here. And it filled it filled this up. So water would just be like, whereas if it's something like this, how do you even have a worldwide flood? How does that even work? <clears throat> Especially if it's spinning at a thousand miles an hour daily and, and, and hurling through space at 66,000 miles. How does that even work? Whereas with this, you have foundations. It's firm. It's set. It doesn't move. That is, of course, unless the most high brings earthquakes. And you have the windows and doors of heaven and the, the great deep with the, the foundations of heaven and the in the found the fountains of the great deep. And so this is the this is the difference. And we learn about literal fountains of heaven through the book of Enoch, here's chapter seventy seven. It says, at the end ends of heaven, I saw the 12 portals. In, in the book of Enoch, the windows are called portals. <clears throat> at the ends of the earth, I saw 12 portals open to all the quarters of the heaven from which the winds go forth and blow over the earth. Three of them are open on the face, i.e. the east of the heavens, and three in the west, and three on the right, the south of the heaven, and three on the left, i.e. the north. And three, the three first are those of the east, and three are of the north, and three after those are on the left. So 12 windows of heaven. And of the south and three of the west. Through four of these come winds of blessing and prosperity. And from those eight come hurtful winds when they are sent. They are they bring destruction on the earth and all the water upon it. And all who dwell thereon and on everything which is in the water and on the land. So this is through. So this is confirming here. So through the windows of heaven came this destruction. So here it's talking about through four of these come uh, winds of blessing and prosperity. And from eight of those... So the other ones come hurtful winds. And these winds are not talking literally about just like the wind that blows like the air. Uh, these winds are the operations of the of the earth. And when they are sent, they bring destruction on the earth and on the water upon it. So this is Enoch is confirming that the windows of heaven uh, are where the destruction of this water came from. And the first wind from those portals called the east wind comes forth through the first portal, which is in the east, inclining toward the south. From it, uh, from it comes forth desolation, drought, heat, and destruction. And through the second portal in the middle comes what is fitting. And from it there comes rain and fruitfulness and prosperity and dew. And through the third portal, which lies toward the north, comes cold and drought. And so it keeps uh, talking, dis discussing more. But I just wanted to give you uh, a brief description of that. If you're interested more about this, we just did a, uh, we finished a book of Enoch series where we went through the entire book line by line and i believe the, the the part we talked more about this was the the four winds so if you go through if you look in the, the parable of the vineyard youtube page go to playlist find the book of enoch uh comprehensive study and find the one that talks about the four winds and uh it might it says like i think it's the four winds and the the four horsemen of the apocalypse of revelation i think <clears throat> here this is enoch 54 we're gonna read seven through ten and in those days shall punishment come from Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of Spirits. And he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heavens. Again, the waters above the heavens, the waters above the firmament. And he will open all the chambers of waters which are above the heavens and of the fountains which are beneath the earth. And all the waters shall be joined with the waters. That which is above the heavens is the masculine and the water which is beneath the earth is feminine. And they shall destroy all who dwell on the earth and those who dwell under the ends of he ends of heaven. So here it's talking about, it explains the waters here will be joined with the waters here and it will destroy everything because it's basically going to fill up. Um, all right, well, so 2 Ezra chapter 4, <clears throat> we're going to read this. 2 Ezra chapter 4, Then the angel that had been sent to me, whose name was Uriel, answered and said to me, Your understanding has utterly failed regarding this world. And do you think that you can comprehend the way of the Most High? Then I said, Oh, yes, my master. And he replied to me, I have been sent to show you three ways and to put before you three problems. If you can solve one of them for me, I will also show you the way that you desire to see and will teach you why the heart is evil. I said, Speak on, my master. And he said to me, Go, weigh for me the weight of fire or measure a measure of wind or call back for me the day that has passed. I answered and said, Who of those that have been born can do this, that you ask me concerning these things? And he, and he said to me, 
If I had asked you how many dwellings are in the heart of the sea, or how many streams are at the source of the deep, so again, talking about the streams of the source of the deep, or how many streams are above the firmament, which are the exits of, and, and, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, how many streams are above the firmament, so it's talking about the, literally the water courses above here and the windows that they come through, <clears throat> Or which are the exits of hell? Or which are the entrances of paradise? Perhaps you would have said to me, I never went down into the deep, nor as of yet into, into hell. Neither did I ever ascend into heaven. But now I've asked you only about fire and wind and the day, th things through which you have passed and without which you cannot exist. And you have given me no answer about them. And he said to me, you cannot understand the things which you have grown up. How then can your mind comprehend the way the Most High? And how can one who is already worn out by the corruption, the corrupt world understand incorruption? When they heard this, I fell on my face and said to him, It would be better for us not to be here than to come here and live in ungodliness and to suffer and not understand why. So just uh, <clears throat> a little off topic, but wanted to have some confirming verses. A third witness about the windows of heaven and the fountains of the deep. And let's not forget, of course, Genesis 1 7, and Elohim made a firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Waters above, waters below. Pretty simple, in my opinion, of course. <clears throat> so um, let's go to let's go to the book of Jasher, chapter six. We're gonna read uh, one through twenty-seven. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we're gonna read. Remember, I was telling you earlier about how, like, how on earth did Noah and his sons go out? And maybe they had one hundred twenty years. You know, maybe. Uh, but it said they only built the ark for five years, so they literally only had five years to go out and and get every creature. Maybe that's enough time. But they're spending so much time building the ark. How do they go out and get every single creature, and literally get every single one, and not miss one? Book of Jasher, chapter 6. At that time, after the death of Methuselah, Yahweh said to Noah, Go with your household into the ark. Behold, I will gather to you all the animals of the earth, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and they shall all come and surround the ark. And you shall go and seat yourself by the doors of the ark, and all the beasts, the animals, and the fowls shall assemble and place themselves before you. And such of them as shall come and crouch before you shall you take and deliver into the hands of your sons who shall bring them into the ark and all that will stand before you shall you leave. So he's basically saying here <clears throat> the animals have to come and humble themselves before uh, Noah basically like in, in their own way of bowing. But the ones that are stand tall and proud you shall leave. And Yahuwah brought this about on the next day, and animals, beasts, and fowls came in great multitudes and surrounded the ark. And Because we know the Most High can do anything. Remember when they were there in the wilderness and they had no meat? They're like, we want meat. Give us meat. And he's like, I'll give you meat. And not for one day or for five days or ten or even twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. And so he's just like, quails, go this way. And they did. Because he's the, he's the operator of everything. And Noah went and seated himself by the door of the ark, and of all flesh that crouched before him, he brought into the ark, and all that stood before him he left upon the earth. And a lioness came with her two whelps, male and female, and three crouched before Noah. The, the, the three. And the two whelps rose up against the lioness and smote her and made her flee from the place. And she went away, and they returned to their places and crouched upon the earth before Noah. And the lioness ran away and stood in the place of the lions. And Noah saw this and wondered greatly, and he rose and took the two whelps and brought them into the ark. And Noah brought into the ark from all living creatures that were upon the earth, so that there was none left but which Noah brought into the ark. Two and two came to Noah into the ark, but from the clean animals and clean fowls he brought seven couples, as Elohim had commanded him. And all the animals and beasts and fowls were still there, and they surrounded the ark at every place, and the rain had not descended till seven days after. And on that day, Yahweh caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the fountains in the earth were broken up, such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And Elohim did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men, that there might be no more evil upon the earth. And still the sons of men would not return from their evil ways, and they increased the anger of Yahweh that time and did not even direct their hearts to all this. And we see this in the book of Revelation. It's no wonder <clears throat> it's no wonder that um, 
that we see the same thing happen in the end time. The, the, what happened at the first end happened the second end. And so the Most High brings about tribulation, hoping that they would turn and repent. It's just much like in most of our lives, he brought some sort of tribulation or pressing in our own personal lives to bring us to repentance and to bring us to, to call upon him and to trust in him and to come back to his ways. And so he does that in a broad way to all the inhabitants of the earth, yet thousands of years ago, they didn't listen. And we see in the book of Revelation, it's going to happen again. And it's interesting. We see in the first end, one one end is is by uh, um, by uh, water, and the next one is by fire. And it's interesting that if you think about it, think about all the the bodies that would have been in the water, and um, you would think that uh, a lot of the the predators of the of the waters, the sharks and whatnot, probably would have fed had just a ton of things to feed on for a long time. And of course, all those things that feed on uh, <clears throat> dead bodies, I'm sure, would, would have a great time. And it, it brings us also, likewise, into the end times. You see, there's a really weird passage. It calls the, the fowls of heaven, come and eat, eat the flesh of captains and the flesh of kings and the flesh of mighty ones. And so <laughs> you had the first end by water. So all the water creatures survived and, and probably ate all those carcasses until they were gone. And so it's interesting that in the, in the last days of the last end, probably uh, we have Messiah destroying all things. You have these bodies. Well, um, have you ever seen like vultures and turkey vultures and, and other and, and other birds that eat carry on, which is, you know, dead bodies? Um, kind of interesting that you, you see that kind of parallel. I don't know if you're following with what I'm saying here, but something that's kind of interesting. And so Jasher 6.13, at the end of seven days, in the 600th year of the life of Noah, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And all the and <clears throat> we'll just we'll just skip on this. Um, yeah, this is actually interesting. We'll read a little bit more. And all the fountains of the deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And Noah and his household and all the living creatures that were with him came into the ark on account of the waters of the flood, and Yahweh shut him in. <clears throat> we'll read the, it's interesting, the, the, uh, the Targums, the Aramaic version of the Bible says, And the word of Yahuwah covered over the door of the ark upon the face of thereof. So it's interesting that we know who the word of the word of the Lord is, the word of Yah is, is Messiah. And all the sons of men that were left upon the earth became exhausted through evil on account of the rain, for the waters were coming more violently upon the earth. And the animals and beasts were still surrounding the ark. And the sons of men assembled together about 700,000 men and women, and they came unto Noah in the ark. And they called unto Noah, saying, Open for us that we may come unto you in the ark, and wherefore shall we die? And Noah with a loud voice answered them from the ark, having saying, Have you not all rebelled against Yahuwah and said that he does not exist? And therefore Yahuwah brought upon you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the face of the earth. Is not this the thing that I spoke to you of 120 years back and you would not hearken to the voice of Yahuwah? And now do you desire to live upon the earth? And they said to Noah, they said to Noah we are ready to return to Yahuwah. Only open for us that we may live and not die. And Noah answered them, saying, Behold, now that you see the trouble of your souls, you wish to return to Yahuwah. Why did you not return during these 120 years which Yahuwah granted you as a determined period? Anyway, so <clears throat> it's too late. So right now, there's still time for repentance. Uh, much like they, you know, the Most High gave them 120 years. This is your allotted period of repentance. But one day, that day's going to be over and it's going to be done. So that door was shut and it was done. So likewise today, we don't know the day or the hour. Certainly we can we can see the season approaching, but one day that's going to end. So people that are are, are, are uh, having a grand old time doing, you know, being prideful and, and sinful and disobedient and arrogant and whatever, and just doing however they please, one day that's going to be over and time's going to be up. And the, it's it, we see the book of Revelation, the, all these different plagues and whatnot, and it says they did not repent of their murders and of their of their sorceries and of their fornications and whatever. And so that's the same thing. Unfortunately, this story the story repeats. We uh, I'm sure we 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 would that it would not be so, but <clears throat> that's just how it's going to be. So in uh, Genesis seven twelve, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the self same day entered Noah. All right, we already read that. Uh, they and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark two of all, two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in went in male and female of all flesh as Elohim had commanded him and Yahuwah shut him in. And so again, we read earlier the word of Yahuwah shut him in according to uh, the Aramaic. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. So, again, I just see that happening here more, where you have more of like a, like a, like a we'll call it a snow globe, that the waters come down here, the waters come up here, and just fills up. 
and it fills up right here. <clears throat> Sorry. And it bore up the ark, and it was lifted above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land died <clears throat> and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground both man and cattle and the creeping thing and the fowls of heavens and they were destroyed from the earth and noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark so it does not say that the um that the um water creatures died which makes sense right if, it's, if they live in water and the water is just you know maybe some did because the waters were probably violent but I don't, you know, it doesn't say that they all died. I, I would imagine that they had a they had a feeding frenzy for a long time with all the bodies, and the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. <clears throat> chapter eight. All right, chapter eight. And Elohim remembered Noah. And every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and Elohim made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the hundred and fifty days the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month in the tenth until the tenth month, in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So again, the waters filled up, and then it started going back down. Well, obviously, obviously, that's I don't need any interpretation. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark, windows of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also, he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, as for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into him in the ark. And um, <clears throat> this is a little, um, kind of a, maybe a stretch here, but I found this kind of interesting. And this is the book of Enoch, um, chapter, uh, what would this be? Um, this would be 42. So we know that when Messiah was baptized, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of the Most High, when it came down upon him, came down in the form of a dove. So let's just let's just go with me for a second here. So let's say this dove here. Um, let's read this again. So imagine this is like the Holy Spirit. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him in, in the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in, him into the ark. Read this kind of interesting parallel. So let's say wisdom, the Spirit symbolized by a dove, found no place where she might dwell. Then a dwelling place was assigned to her in the heavens. Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men and found no dwelling place. Wisdom returned to her place and took her seat among the angels. So you kind of see this little parallel here that, um, <clears throat> you know, after the, this reset here, if you want to call it that, um, let's say he sent out the Holy Spirit and there was nothing found and he brought it back into him. So the Most High sent out his spirit upon the earth to dwell with men and no dwelling place was found. So wisdom returned to her place and took her seat. So the dove went out, the spirit went out and came back in because no one, no one accepted her. No one wanted her. And unrighteousness went forth from her chambers whom she sought not she found and dwelt with them as a rain in a desert and dew in a thirsty land. So the dove went out, came back, and he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So it's interesting that we know that, that um, Israel is the olive tree, <clears throat> whether we're of the natural branch or grafted in. Either way, of the olive tree. So the, let's say the Holy Spirit was sent out, came back, nothing. And so sent out again, and plucked, and you have this olive olive leaf symbolizing the uh, the the seed of Abraham, the, the olive tree, if you will. So kind of interesting. Nothing concrete there, but I find it kind of an interesting parallel. And he stayed yet other seven days and f sent forth a dove, which returned not again into him anymore. 
And it came to pass in the 601st, in, in, in kind of with this, um, of course, through Messiah now, through Messiah and baptism, we have <clears throat> the promise of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was sent out and finally you know, sent to dwell, upon, uh, dwell amongst men. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, the earth was dried. And Elohim spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, you and your woman and your sons and your sons' woman with you. Bring forth with you every living creature that is with you of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, <clears throat> and his sons and his woman, and his sons went with him, of every beast, of every creeping thing, and of every fowl, and whatsoever creeps upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto Yahuwah. Like, how did he know that, how to do that? And we learned about that, of course, last week through um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve and their sons. And took of every clean beast and of every f clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. How did Noah know what was clean and how to offer them upon the altar if there was no law, no Torah back then? And Yahuwah smelled a sweet savor, and Yahuwah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. However, uh, in there will be an end of those operations. Earlier I had mentioned the book of Enoch study about the four winds and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you want to learn more about what I'm getting ready to share with you, that video may also bless you as well. So the promise is that <clears throat> basically the sun and the moon, the sun's going to keep doing its thing. The winds of the earth will keep doing its thing. The operations of earth will keep doing their things until one day here in Enoch, uh, what is this? Enoch uh, 80. Yeah. <clears throat> says this. And in those days, the angel Uriel answered and said to me, Behold, I have shown you everything, Enoch, and I have revealed everything to you that you should see this sun and this moon and the leader of the stars of heaven and all those who turn them, their tasks and their times. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, okay. And their tasks and their times. And in the days of the sinners, the years shall be shortened. So we know the years come by the luminaries, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And their seed shall be tardy on their lands and fields, and all things on the earth shall alter. And the days of the sinners, I believe the days of the sinners is the days of the tribulation, and shall not appear in their time, and the rain shall be kept back, and the heaven shall withhold it. And in those times, the fruits of the earth shall be backward, and shall not grow in their time, and the fruits of the tree shall be withheld in their time. And the moon shall alter her order, and not appear at her time. And in those days the sun shall be seen, and he shall journey in the evening on the extremity of the great chariot in the west, and shall shine more brightly than accords with the order of light. And many chiefs of the stars shall transgress their order, and these shall alter their orbits and tasks, and shall not appear the seasons prescribed to them. And the whole order of the stars shall be concealed from the sinners, and the thoughts of those on the earth shall err concerning them, and they shall be altered from all their ways. Yea, they shall be take them to be gods, and evil shall be multiplied upon them, and punishment shall come upon them so as to destroy them all. So this is talking about the, the end times, of course, and how the operations of everything is going to change. And, um, and so that's when this is going to end. So while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And that is until these end times, what the book of Enoch calls uh, the days of the sinners. Right, where is it? Yeah. And the days of the sinners, which I do believe is the days of the great tribulation, which is <clears throat> the end, the end of all things. Uh, let's see here in the book of Yashar, we're going to read chapter 6, 28 through 42. Oops. 28 through 42. Uh, you know, we'll skip that one. Some some homework for you, Jasher 6, 28 through 42. Um, here's something I want to read from the Targums. It says, And Noah builded the altar before Yahuwah, that altar which Adam had builded in the time when he cast forth, when he was cast forth from the Garden of Eden and had offered an oblation upon it. And upon it Cain and Abel offered their oblation. But when the waters of the deluge descended, it was destroyed and Noah rebuilt it. So we read about that last week in the first book of Adam and Eve, chapters 23 through 25. So if you missed last week, uh, I, would, uh, I would recommend uh, reading that at your uh, at your opportunity, at your leisure. So now chapter 9. 
And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear, so this is a, this is a command. This is a command out of the garden. This is a command at the, the, the reset. You know, the, the, we'll call it the reset. If everybody wants to talk about the great reset, uh, that's the great reset that I'm familiar with. And so this is a command, and it's still a command, I believe, today. And, and I know some of, and this is not to put any of you in un, uh, an uncomfortable uh, feeling, because I know some of you can't have children or, or don't haven't had the opportunity to. But uh, I would encourage anyone that can to be fruitful and multiply. And if it's a, uh, if there's a, if there's a anxiety that, <clears throat> you know, they may cost too much money or may not provide. Listen, who provides everything? All the gold, all the silver, everything belongs to the Most High. So I would just encourage you to. Take a look at this. Is, so we want to talk about Torah. I mean, we, usually when we talk about Torah, we think about you know the, the Sabbath, the uh, feast days, the clean eating, zitzit, so on and so forth. This is Torah. Be fruitful and multiply. So if you can, multiply. Be fruitful. Yeah. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl upon the air, upon all that moves on the earth and upon all the fish of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as a green herb have I given you all things. So this is an interesting passage because it seems to contradict because later on in the Torah, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, we find out what's clean and unclean and we're not supposed to be eat the unclean things. And the way this is written, some people can interpret this thing that everything that moves or that lives shall be food for you. Wherein we learned earlier that even Noah back then knew the distinction between clean and unclean. And so certainly uh, the scriptures wouldn't contradict itself. Um, but here, verse four, but the flesh, the, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat? And we spoke about this last week as well, uh, about the importance of the blood, not to eat it. And surely your blood of your lives will I require it. At the hand of every beast will I require it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Elohim made he man. And this is something interesting <clears throat> to really have a, uh, hopefully a renewed perspective of. Often when I say, you know, take a look at the world and the sin and all of the detestable things that are going on in the world. Um, if you've ever heard the term hate the sin, not the sinner, there, there's really some truth to that, even though that's not only a Bible verse. There's some truth to that because we shouldn't look down upon people in their lives outside of the faith that are just blinded because, because really at the end of the day, these are people that were made in the image of Elohim. So even though they're not walking in the image of the Elohim, they were made in the image of Elohim. They have flesh, they have blood, they have a spirit in them. They have the breath of life in them, just like we do. And they're just on the unfortunate side of believing and trusting in uh, things outside of the word of Elohim. They've, they believe that they were born this way and can live this way. And we should recognize that these people have an opportunity to repent and to turn just as we did. Even the crazy rulers of the earth. I say crazy. Crazy wrong. I shouldn't say crazy. Even the, the, I, I, I repent of, of saying that. Even the rulers of the earth who a lot of us have researched, uh, I'm sure these, these great conspiracies of what these people are doing behind the scenes. I believe that they have the opportunity to repent too. We, we read about in, in Second Chronicles, I believe, Second uh, Chronicles 33, we learn about the story of Manasseh, who was one of the worst kings <clears throat> in all of Judah's history. I mean, just um, d did everything wrong. I mean, just literally, literally cut the prophet Isaiah in half with a wooden saw. Um, just did everything detestable. But in his affliction, he it said that he repented and had an amazing prayer to the Most High, and the Most High forgave him. Now, his life wasn't uh, roses and, and, and uh, petunias afterward, but... <clears throat> said he was forgiven. So my point is, is if you we look at our lives and and, and maybe some of you didn't live really uh, terrible lives, but from some of the testimonies I've heard from a lot of you and looking at my whole life and looking at the testable things that we did, well, if if he allowed us to do it, he can allow really anyone to do that. And so we should have long suffering and patience with everyone around us. And in our goal should be to share the good news with everyone that we can. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you need to like. You know, well, I'll let you pray about that and let the Most High um, share with you of how to share these things. But certainly, if we look at Second Timothy two twenty four through twenty seven, that anyone that's to be a teacher of the Most High or a sharer of His Word should do so in meekness and patience and long suffering, not to go with a bullhorn and say you're all going to hell. And I just don't, I don't think that's the way that we share these days. 
just my opinion. Maybe we all, maybe that, maybe people have their different lanes, and maybe some people are 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 called to to yell and scream. But the, when I look at the word of Elohim and look at the way um, Messiah taught his disciples to be, I, I just don't see that. Point being, long long rabbit hole here. Point being is that people are made in, in the image of Elohim, and everybody has an opportunity to repent. And it's we shouldn't we shouldn't look at like ah we're here we got the truth we're good um, <clears throat> we got salvation assured of us. Pfft. Too bad for y'all, suckers. No. These are people, and they're just deceived. Think about it. Don't be mad at them. Again, this is a, probably some churchy term, but hate the sin, not the sinner. I think there's some there's something to that. At least when you when you look at people, be, be, be like, oh, man, I feel bad for them. Instead of like, oh, disgusting. Maybe be like, oh, man. Feel bad for them, and and have and and have a heart for them. And be like, oh man, I know what it's like to be deceived. Let me let me share let me let me share something with them in, in love and in patience and meekness. All right, <clears throat> and you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And Elohim spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And just let me pause here real quick. It's kind of further. Hebrews twelve fourteen says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see Yahuwah. Think about that for a second. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. <clears throat> neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. <clears throat> Sorry. Something in my throat. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow, of course, is the rainbow, shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And Elohim said unto Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. This is the rainbow. <clears throat> if you didn't know... The Most High's rainbow has seven colors. The uh, other crowd that uses it has six colors. They've removed indigo, which is like that bluish color. So they've taken, they went from seven to six. Interesting, because, you know, you know, there's some meaning behind numbers. I'm not really a numerologist or get too heavy into numbers, but <clears throat> we can see that in, in last week's Torah portion, seven is a, is a number of completion. We have um, the six days of work and the seventh is rest, completing seven, completion. And uh, they've taken that, removed one color, and made it six. So uh, keep that in mind, that, that the rainbow itself is not bad, but what they have done to it, and uh, they've taken that symbol and, and, of course, removed one color and defiled it. What's interesting, I find fascinating, is Messiah comes back with a rainbow. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow upon his head, and his face was as the sun, and his feet pillars of fire. We also learn here that <clears throat> the book that only the Lamb could open was open in his hand. So he's going to come back with a rainbow upon his head. Why? This is kind of a, a, a deeper rabbit trail, and uh, I'm trying to think of what video might be good. Um, we also did a Revelation line-by-line -line series a couple years ago. In the last two um Revelation 21 and 22, we kind of cover this, that I believe that when Messiah comes back, he comes back with New Jerusalem. Uh, it's really uh, clearly pointed out in 2 Ezra chapter 13 that when Messiah comes, he's going to come with New Jerusalem. And we know that New Jerusalem has 12 foundation stones. And what's really interesting in these last times, we found that the 12 stones that the Most High picked happen to be 12 stones that when pure light is shown through them, it shines all colors of the rainbow. So if Messiah is the light and he comes with the brightness and the and New Jerusalem's above his head with the, the 12 stones that all shine the light of the rainbow when pure light is shined through them, I believe that he comes down with New Jerusalem with the rainbow, the covenant, the peace comes with him and the reward for his people. 
it's kind of kind of interesting. But <clears throat> so again, he says in uh, verse uh, Genesis nine seventeen, and Elohim said to Noah, "This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh is upon the earth." And so this is that covenant that you know that all these things that he's not going to destroy the earth. That he's not going to destroy the earth. But that changes, of course, of course, in the end times. Enoch 55, 1 through 2 says, And after that, the head of days repented and said, In vain have I destroyed all who dwell on the earth. And he swore by his great name, Henceforth I will not do so to all who dwell on the earth. And I will set a sign in the heaven, of course, the, the, the rainbow, and this shall be a pledge of good faith between me and them forever, comma, so long as heaven is above the earth. Wait a minute. Er, what does that mean? New Jerusalem is heaven, is the renewed heaven, the renewed earth. So when it comes down, that time is over. And we, when we learn that here, <clears throat> a little further in Revelation 10, I don't know why I have the Geneva up here. I don't really like that much. Revelation 10, <clears throat> again, we saw that um, he came, he comes down, rainbow upon his head, face as the sun, feet as pillar of fires, and he had in his hand a little book. This can't be anyone but Messiah. And uh, here you can see he swears by him that lives forever, ever, who created heaven and the things that are there, that therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are there, and that there should be time no longer. Why? <clears throat> because the firmament has been cracked, rolled back like a scroll, and Messiah comes down with his reward. New Jerusalem, the rainbow, the real, real covenant, the real sign. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Genesis 9, 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Which is interesting. <clears throat> I find it interesting because I've recently heard doctrine that like, certain races are like... How, how was it explained to me? That they were kind of like an alien creature. That they weren't normal. Um, uh, I find it really, really, really interesting. But it, it says here that of them, of these three sons, that the whole earth was overspread. And I find it interesting that um, even science would say that everyone that living today either came from a white man, a red man, or a black man. And I find that interesting because that's exactly what the book of Enoch talks about. Uh, let's talk about this. This is Enoch. This is 50, 67, 89. Enoch 89. And this is part of the dream vision where Enoch is shown the entire history of man from Adam and Eve all the way to the end when Messiah returns in New Jerusalem. <clears throat> and through it um, is used like uh, animals to portray people and stuff like that. So, And one of those four went to that white bull, which is Noah, and instructed him in secret without his being terrified. He was born a bull and became a man, this is Noah, and built for himself a great vessel, this is the ark, and dwelt thereon. And three bulls dwelt with him in that vessel, and they were covered in. This is, of course, the three sons of Noah. And again, I raised mine eyes toward heaven and saw a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon. And those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. Into an enclosure. This is what we're talking about here. Much water flowed into an enclosure. This is what the book of Enoch says. Again, I saw and behold, fountains were opened on the surface of the great enclosure, and that water began to swell and rise upon the surface, and I saw that enclosure till all its surface was covered with water. Uh, oops. And the water, the darkness, and the mist increased upon it. And as I looked at the height of that water, that the water had risen above the height of that enclosure and was streaming over that enclosure, and it stood upon the earth. And all the cattle of that enclosure were gathered together until I saw how that they sank and were swallowed up and perished in that water. But that vessel floated on the water while all the oxen and elephants and camels and asses sank to the bottom with all the animals so that I could no, no longer see them. And they were not able to escape, but perished and sank into the depths. And again, I saw in the vision till those water torrents were removed from that high roof and the chasms of the earth were leveled up and the other abysses were opened. Then the water began to run down into these till the earth became visible. But that vessel settled on the earth and the darkness retired and light appeared. But that white bull, Noah, which had become a man, came out of that vessel and three bulls with him. Listen to this. And one of those three was white like that bull and one of them was red as blood and one black, 
and that white people departed from them. So it's interesting because, <clears throat> again, I had heard recently that that white people were like basically like kind of a freak show. Um, they weren't normal. That Yah didn't create them. And this is where I just I disagree because I, I believe Enoch is scripture, and it says as we saw from the the two accounts of the birth of Noah um, that he that you know that he was white. And this is not some kind of race superiority thing, but this is kind of saying that you know that Yah created. Right here, Yah created um, white, a uh, white, uh, white man, a red man, and a black man, and these are all from Yah. And these are all people. And going back to what I was saying earlier, they're all made in the image of Yah, and everyone has the equal right to accept Messiah Yahusha and become the seed of Abraham through faith, as Galatians three tells us about. So, just wanted to share that. I thought that was kind of interesting that the Book of Enoch actually confirms with what even. You know, I don't know, science, whatever everyone want to call that science, but um, they teach the same, they, they say the same thing. Everybody came from either a white, red, or a black man. And I think that's pretty neat. I'm um, just closing some tabs here. Here we go. Okay, so we're gonna, also going to read the, uh, what are we going to read here? Okay, now we're going to go back to Genesis. Uh, Genesis 9.20, And Noah began to be a husbandman, <clears throat> and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Yepheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, which is interesting because Ham did the deed. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So we'll stop there. So it's like, why did he curse Canaan? There's a lot of theories out there. Some say, you know, Ham uh, had intercourse with his mother. Because when you do look at the Torah, it's like when you do something like that, it's called uncovering the nakedness of your father. But really, he didn't uncover the nakedness of his father. It says very plainly that he was drunk and was uncovered within his tent. So uh, Ham didn't uncover him. He was uncovered himself. Some would say, some say that Ham did the deed and Canaan was the offspring of this. But I, I don't agree. I think it was literally as the Bible says that um, Noah drank, was drunk, and he was naked in his tent, and Ham came and saw, I was like, look, look, look at that, look. And, of course, uh, Shem and Yepheth, the, the two more righteous, were like, I'm not looking. Let's go and cover our father's nakedness. That's exactly what it says. Let's cover their nakedness. But why, <clears throat> but the question is, why was Canaan cursed? Not Ham. Book of Jubilees, I think, gives us a little bit of uh, insight here. Because I believe Noah was prophesying. <clears throat> Jubilees chapter 10 uh, yeah 10 27 through 34 says this this is and this is here we're just kind of skipping this here uh, Noah gave land assignments of where after um, where, where the people were supposed to spread out and, and inhabit the land so this is after the uh, the um, spreading out of the Tower of Babel which we'll read about the Tower of Babel here in just a bit in the fourth week in the first year in the beginning thereof in the four and thirtieth Jubilee were they dispersed from the land of Shinar? This is where the Tower of Babel was. And Ham and his sons went into the land which he was to occupy, which he acquired as his portion in the land of the south, Africa. And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good. This is the, the promised land. And he went not into the land of his inheritance to the west, that is, to the sea. And he dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward from the border of Jordan and from the border of the sea. And Ham, his father, and Cush, and, the, and Mitzrayim, his brothers, said unto him, You have settled in a land which is not yours, and which did not fall to us by lot. Do not do so. For if you do so, you and your sons will fall in the land and be accursed through sedition. So, cursed. <clears throat> so again, this is Canaan. For by sedition you have settled, and by sedition will your children fall, and you shall be rooted out forever. Dwell not in the dwellings of Shem, for to Shem and to his sons did it come by their lot. Cursed are you, and cursed shall you be beyond all the sons of Noah, by the curse by which we bound ourselves by an oath in the presence of the holy judge and in the presence of Noah our father. But he did not hearken unto them, and dwelt in the land of Lebanon from Hamath to the entering of Egypt, he and his sons unto this day, and for this reason the land is named Canaan. That's why he was cursed. Noah was prophesying, cursed to be Canaan. This is also why the Israelites, they were commanded to go in and kill everything, because they were they were um, accursed and that they would be rooted out forever. I believe that's the most simple explanation. 
Also, a little extra part here about this. Um, mm, oh, I thought I had the. Uh, let's see. I want to read another part. We're going to read, let's see, uh, we're going to read Writings of Abraham, chapter 17. So let's keep going. Now, when the flood had abated and the ark had come to rest upon the top of the mountain, Noah and his family descended the, descended the and after and offered off sacrifices unto Yahuwah and dedicated the land, they began to till the ground and raise all manner of crops. And when the great harvest was come in, Noah made wine and drank of the new wine in his tent, and his heart was made glad, and he rejoiced before Yahuwah for the bounty which Yahuwah had given him. And it was upon the feast of Pentecost when Noah drank of the new wine before Yahuwah and lay down naked in his tent to sleep. When Ham, the son of Noah, entered the tent, he saw his father sleeping naked upon his bed with the sacred garments which he had been given to Adam in the Garden of Eden and laying nearby. And Ham knew that he and his posterity could not bear the priesthood because of the curse of Cain which was upon them, and knowing that there was great power in the sacred garments, he stole them from his father... Noah and hurried to his tents, rousing his family. Ham instructed them to strike their tents and led them away to the plain of Shinar, where he dwelt and where Ham died. So I thought that was kind of interesting. A little interesting, also uh, information about what actually happened in that tent and uh, what was really going on here. So just wanted to share that with you. Uh, also wanted to share with you that um, here we'll tell you. We'll just read. We'll finish up chapter nine, and I want to share a couple more things about Noah that we read about through other books like Jubilees. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh Elohai of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Elohim shall enlarge Yepheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So let's read a little bit more about Noah. Let's go and read about um, Noah teaching the commandments in the book of Jubilees. Jubilees chapter 7. Jubilee 7, 20 through 24. And in the 28th Jubilee, Noah began to enjoin upon his sons, sons, the ordinances and the commandments and all the judgments that he knew. And he exhorted his sons to observe righteousness and to cover the shame of their flesh and to bless their creator and honor father and mother and love their neighbor and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanness and all iniquity. For owing to these three things came the flood upon the earth, namely owing to the fornication wherein the watchers against the law of their ordinances went a whoring after the daughters of men and took themselves wives of all which they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanness. And they begat sons, the Nephilim, and they were all unlike, and they devoured one another. And the giants slew the Nephil, and the Nephil slew the Eljo, and the Eljo mankind, and one man another. And everyone sold himself to work iniquity and to shed much blood, and the earth was filled with iniquity. So this is another confirming witness with what we were reading earlier. And after this, they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moves and walks upon the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. So the point is here is that Noah taught all his sons the, the commandments. And the reason I say this is because <clears throat> some people will be like, oh, well, it's not fair. The Most High only taught the commandments to the Israel. It's not true. Everyone had an opportunity to serve him. To Ezra 7, 17 to 25. Then I, and this is Ezra like just lamenting for you know Israel who was in captivity and also for all the nations. All the people that are going to die. Then I answered and said, Oh, sovereign master, behold, you have ordained in your law that the righteous shall inherit the th these things, but that the ungodly shall perish. The righteous, therefore, can endure difficult circumstances while hoping for easier ones. But those who have done wickedly have suffered the difficult circumstances and will not see the easier ones. And he said to me, You are not a better judge than Elohim or wiser than the Most High. Now listen to this. Let many perish who are now living rather than the law, the Torah of Elohim, which is set before them, be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into the world when they came what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Well, it's like, well, where did that happen? Well, we just read that in Jubilees. That, and they came off of the ark, right? Noah began to enjoin upon his sons and his sons' sons the ordinances and commandments and all the judgments that he knew. 
So let's read this again. Let many perish who are now living rather than the law, the Torah of Elohim, which is set before them, be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into the world when they came what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient and spoke against him. They devised for themselves vain thoughts and proposed to themselves wicked frauds. They even declared that the Most High does not exist. And they ignored his ways and they scorned his law. And denied his covenants, and they have been unfaithful to his statutes, and have not performed his works. And then you look around, look at the nations. They serve idols of of wood and stone and gold and silver and all these things because they're carrying on the vain traditions of their fathers who walked away from the Most High. Period. Genesis 10. Actually, you know, Jubilees. I want to read this. Jubilees 10. 1 through 7, 1 through 17. And in the third week of this jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to make to err and to destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his son's sons. And he prayed before Yahuwah's Elohim and said, Elohim of the spirits of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto me, and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood, and has not caused me to perish as you did the sons of perdition. <coughs> I'm so sorry. For your grace has been great towards me, and great has been your mercy to my soul. Let your grace be lift up upon my sons, and let not wicked spirits rule over them, lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do you bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And you know how the, your watchers, the fathers of these spirits, acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them and hold them fast in the place of condemnation. And let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my Elohim. For these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And let them not rule over the spirits of the living, for you alone canst exercise dominion over them. And let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And Yahuwah Elohim bade us to bind all, that is, the unclean spirits. And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, which is another word for, uh, another name for Satan, came and said, Yahuwah, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and for leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men." And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. And one of us, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that they would not walk in uprightness nor strive in righteousness. And we did according to all his word and all the malignant evil ones we bound in the place of condemnation. And a tenth part of them we left that they might be subject before Satan on the earth. And we explained to Noah all the medicines of their diseases, together with their seductions, how he might heal them with the herbs of the earth. Hello, we talked about that last week. And Noah wrote down all things in a book, as we instructed him concerning every kind of medicine. Thus the evil spirits were precluded from hurting the sons of Noah. And he gave all that he had written to Shem, his eldest son, for he loved him exceedingly above all his sons. And Noah slept with his fathers and was buried on Mount Lubar in the land of Ararat. 950 years he completed in his life. 19 jubilees in two weeks and five years. And in his life on the earth, he excelled the children of men, save Enoch, because of the righteousness wherein he was perfect. For Enoch's office was ordained for a testimony to the generations of the world, so that he should recount all the deeds of the generation, of generation unto generation, till the day of judgment. So I just wanted to read um, the last couple things about Noah before we ended Noah and moved on to. The Tower of Babel and Nimrod and all that good stuff. So, in which which is in chapter ten? Okay, Genesis ten. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Yavan and Tubal and Meshech and Tirak, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Rifa and Togarma, and the sons of Yavan, Elisha and Tarshish, Kitim and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the other nations divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families and their nations. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seva, Chavila, Kafta, and Rama, and Kafteka, and the sons of Rama, Sheva, and Didan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a warrior or a giant uh, in the earth. 
And he was a warrior and a hunter before Yahuwah, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the warrior hunter, or the giant hunter, really, I don't know why he did warrior here, but it's, yeah, the Gabor, the giant hunter before, the great hunter before Yahuwah. So, um, let's stop there real quick. I want to talk about Nimrod. Let's go to Jasher 7. Jasher 7, 23 through 30. <clears throat> And Cush, the son of Ham, the son of Noah, took a wife in those days in his old age, and she bare a son, and they called his name Nimrod, saying, At that time the sons of men again began to rebel and transgress against Elohim. And the child grew up, and his father loved him exceedingly, for he was the son of his old age. And the garments of skin which Elohim made for Adam and his wife when they went out of the garden were given to Cush. For after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Jared. And when Enoch was taken up to Elohim, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. At the end of the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them to the ark, and they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father, which we read earlier in the writings of Abraham, and took them and hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begot his firstborn Cush, he gave him the garments in secret, and they were with Cush many days. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and his brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up, and when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. And Nimrod became strong when he put on those garments. And Elohim gave him might and strength, and he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mighty hunter in the field, and he hunted the animals, and he built altars and offered up upon them animals before Yahuwah. So it looks like <clears throat> at first he started to serve Yah, but we learn later that that's not quite the case. Um, I have a note here to look at the writings of Abraham. Why do I keep closing that tab? I'm not sure why. The writings of Abraham... Writings of Abraham, what chapter? 18? Here's another witness. Before the death of the Ham, the sacred garments were given secretly by him to his son Cush. <clears throat> Cush also kept them hidden and in his old age gave them unto his son Nimrod. And when Nimrod was 20 years of age, he put on the garments and he derived great strength and power. And moreover, Nimrod was instructed in all the secrets of the evil combination by his father Cain, for Cain had not perished in the flood. Uh, well, the seed of Cain had not perished in the flood. Wherefore, Nimrod became a mighty man among the sons of men and established his kingdom and grew stronger and stronger in wickedness after the order of the secret combination, which was from the beginning. For Nimrod spread his dominion over all mankind, save those in the city of Shalom. Yeru Shalom. And at the, uh, let's see. <clears throat> and at the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Ashur and built Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kelach and Resen between Nineveh and Kelach. The same as a great city. And Mitzrayim, Egypt, begat Ludim and Ananim and Lehavim and Naphtusim and Pathrusim and Kalhusim out of whom came the, Pelish, the Pelishtim, which is the Philistines. And the Kaphtarim. And Canaan begat Sidon his firstborn, and Chet, and the Yebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Semarite, and the Hamathite. And afterward were the families of the Canaanim spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanim was from Sidon as you come into Gerar, unto Gaza as you go into Sodom, and Amora, and Adma, and Seboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. And unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were the children born. And the children of Shem, Elam, and Ashur, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. And the children of Aram, Uts, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash. And Arphaxad begat Shelach, and Shelach begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Yoktan. And Yoktan begat Almudad, and Sheleph, and Chatzar Maveth, and Yerach. And Hadoram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Oval, and Avi Mael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Chavilah, and Yobab, all these were the sons of Yoktan. And their dwelling was from Misha as you go into Safar, a mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. <coughs> so here we are, Genesis 11. And this will be the last chapter we read today. 
So here's the Tower of Babel. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they from order. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto the heavens. And let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And Yahweh said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from thence upon all the face of the earth, and they left off the bidi, the, to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because Yahweh did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did Yahweh scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. <clears throat> There's a lot more here to this story, than because uh, we get a brief little just description here in, in uh, the Torah. I want to read a couple other passages for you that uh, really uh, bring this story to life here. So we're going to go to chapter 7 of the book of Yashar. We're going to go all the way down to verse 43. And we're going to read a little more. And they found a large valley opposite the east, and they built him a large and extensive city. And Nimrod called the name of that city he built Shinar, for Yahweh had vehemently shaken his enemies and destroyed them. And Nimrod dwelt in Shinar, and he reigned securely, and he fought with his enemies, and he subdued them, and he prospered in all his battles, and his kingdom became very great. And all nations and tongues heard of his fame, and they gathered themselves to him, and they bowed down to the earth, and they brought him offerings, and he became their lord and their king. And they all dwelt with him in the city at Shinar, and Nimrod reigned in the earth over all the sons of Noah, and they were all under his power and counsel. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union, which is interesting because what we see here is uh, the, the, the great reset, if you will, and all the people came together and were of one tongue and they united to destroy the Most High or to attempt to destroy the Most High. <clears throat> and then they were scattered. And here in the last days, people are gathered together again. So as most of us understand, most countries have leaders that are all part of the same brotherhood alliance. That though they act like they're in opposition, they're all doing these things to push forth an agenda to bring about the end times. But really, they've all been united, especially through, you look at the League of Nations, which became the uh, United Nations. Uh, they, have, they have come together. But Nimrod did not go in the ways of Yahuwah, and he was more wicked than all the men that were before him from the days of the flood until those days. And he made gods of wood and stone and bowed down to them, and he rebelled against Yahuwah and taught all his subjects and the people of the earth his wicked ways. And Mardon, his son, was more wicked than his father. And everyone that heard of the acts of Mardon, the son of Nimrod, would say concerning him, from the wicked goes forth wickedness, which uh, is quoted in the book of, uh, is it First Samuel, I think? Uh, David quotes this of the old proverb that says from the wicked goes forth wickedness so he's quoting the book of Yashar therefore it became a proverb in the whole earth saying from the wicked goes forth wickedness and it was current in the words of men from that time to this and Terah the son of Nahor the prince of Nimrod's host was in those days very great in the sight of the king and his subjects and the king and the princes loved him and they elevated him very high um, and what we'll actually we'll pause there real quick because I want to finish Genesis 11 because we have the introduction of Terah and Abraham and uh, then we'll finish up with uh, with the Ashar, and we'll pretty much be done. <clears throat> These are the generations of Shem. So back to Genesis 11.10. These are the gener generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxad lived five and 30 years and begat Shelach. And Arphaxad lived after he begat Shelach 403 years and begat sons and daughters. And Shelach lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Shalach lived after he begot Eber 403 years and begot sons and daughters. And Eber lived four and thirty years and begot Peleg. And Eber lived after he begot Peleg 430 years and begot sons and daughters. And Peleg lived thirty years and begot Reu. And Peleg lived after he begot Reu 209 years and begot sons and daughters. And Reu lived two and thirty years and begot Serug. And Reu lived after he begot Serug 270 years and begot sons and daughters. And Serug lived thirty years and begot Nahor. And Sarug lived after he begot Nahor 200 years and begot sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begot Terach. This is where, this is why I wanted to lead up to this because we're reading about Terach and you're like, well, you know, who's Terach? Terach, the son of Nahor. So Nahor lived 9 and 20 years and begot Terach. And Nahor lived after he begot Terach 119 years and begot sons and daughters. 
And Terach lived 70 years and begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are generations of Terach. Terach begot Avram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Lot. And Haran died before his father Terach in the land of his nativity in the Ur of the Kazdim. We're either going to read about that this week or next week, and we're going to learn about why Haran died. It just gives you that mention, but it doesn't tell you what happened. It's an amazing story, or a wild story, if you will. <clears throat> And Avram and Nahor took them women. The name of Avram's woman was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's woman, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Yik, Yika. But Sarai was barren, and she had no child. And Terah took Avram his son, and Lot the son of his Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Avram's woman, and they went forth with him from Ur of the Kazdim to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. The days of Tarach were 205 years, and Tarach died in Haran. So now, <clears throat> that's the end of the Torah portion, but let us I want to give you a lot of the backstory because it's really, um, as we've learned before, the, the, the Torah is really just brief. It gives you brief, you know, touches on this, touches on that, touches on that, and just moves on. But if you're like me, uh, if you're still with me, uh, how long into this? If you're still with me an hour and 45 minutes into this Torah portion, uh, then you probably have an interest of learning more. And so uh, the Most High has given us the more through these books if we want to learn, if we want to seek it out. <clears throat> this is kind of a longer read, so here we go. And this, this will kind of end the Torah portion. So, and Terah, the son of Nahor, prince of Nimrod's host, so to, uh, Abraham's father, was a prince of Nimrod, was in those days very great in the sight of the king and his subjects, and the king and the princes loved him, and they elevated him very high. And Terah took a wife, and her name was Amthelo, the daughter of Cornebo. The wife of Terah conceived and bare him a son in those days. Terah was seventy years old when he begat him, and Terah called the name of his son that was born to him Abram, because the king had raised him in those days and dignified him above all his princes that were with him. Chapter 8. And it was in that night that Abram was born that all the servants of Terah and all the wise men of Nimrod and his conjurers came and ate and drank in the house of Terah, and they rejoiced with him on that night. And when all the wise men and conjurers went out from the house of Terah, they lifted up their eyes toward the heaven that night to look at the stars. And they saw, and behold, one very large star came from the east and ran in the heavens, and he swallowed up the four stars from the four sides of the heavens. And all the wise men of the king and his conjurers were astonished at the sight. And the sages understood this matter, and they knew its import. And they said to each other, This only betokens the child that has been born to Terah this night, who will grow up and be fruitful and multiply and possess all the earth, he and his children forever. He and his seed will slay great kings and inherit their lands. And the wise men and conjurers went home that night. In the morning, all the wise men and the conjurers rose up early and assembled in an appointed house. And they spoke and said to each other, Behold, the sight that we saw last night is hidden from the king and has not been made known to him. And should this thing get known to the king in the latter days, he will say to us, Why have you concealed this matter from me? And then we shall all suffer death. Therefore, now let us go and tell the king the sight which we saw and in the interpretation thereof, and we shall find, and then shall we remain clear. And they did so. And they all went to the king and bowed down to him to the ground. And they said, May the king live, may the king live. We heard that a son was born to Terah, the son of Nahor, the prince of your host. And we yesternight came to the, his house, and we ate and drank and rejoiced with him that night. And when your servants went out from the house of Terah to go to our respective homes to abide there for that night, we lifted up our eyes to heaven and we saw a great star coming from the east. And the same star ran with great speed and swallowed up four great stars from the four sides of the heavens. And your servants were astonished at the sight which we saw and were greatly terrified. And we made our judgment upon the sight and knew by our wisdom the proper interpretation thereof that this thing applies to the child that is born to Terah who will grow up and multiply greatly and become powerful and kill all the kings of the earth and inherit all their lands he and his seed forever now our master and king behold we have truly acquainted you with what we have seen concerning this child and if it seems good to the king to give his father valley for his child we will slay him before he grows up and increase in the land and his evil increase against us that we and our children perish through this evil and the king heard their words and they seemed good in his sight and he sent and called for Terah and Terah came before the king and the king said to Terah, I have been told that a son was yesternight born to you, and after this manner was observed in the heavens at his birth. And now, therefore, give me the child, that we may slay him before his evil spring up against us, and I will give you for his value your house full of silver and gold. And Terah answered the king and said to him, My master and king, I have heard your words, and your servant shall do all that his king desires. But, my lord and king, 
I will tell you what happened to me yesterday night, that I may see what advice the king will give his servant. And then will I answer the king upon what he has spoken. And the king said, Speak. <clears throat> and Teresa the king, Ion, son of Mored, came to me yesterday night, saying, Give unto me the great and beautiful horse that the king gave you, and I will give you silver and gold and straw and provender for its value. And I said to him, Wait till I see the king concerning your words, and behold, whatever the king says, that will I do. And now, my master and king, behold, I have made this thing known to you, and the advice which my king will give unto his servant, that will I follow. And the king heard the words of Terah, and his anger was kindled, and he considered him in the light of a fool. And the king answered Terah, and he said to him, Are you so silly, ignorant, or deficient in understanding to do this thing, to give your beautiful horse for silver and gold, or even for straw and provender? Are you so short of silver and gold that you should do this thing, because you can't obtain straw and provender to feed your horse? And what is silver and gold to you, or straw and provender, that you should give away that fine horse which I gave you, like which there is none to be had on the whole earth? And the king left off speaking. And Terah answered the king, saying, Like unto this has the king spoken to your servant. So Terah like, told him a parable. I beseech you, my master and king, th what is this which you did say unto me, saying, Give your son that we may slay him, and I will give you silver and gold for his value. What shall I do with silver and gold after the death of my son? Who shall inherit me? Surely then at my death the silver and gold will return to my king who gave it. And when the king heard the words of Terah and the parable which he brought concerning the king, it grieved him greatly, and he was vexed at this thing, and his anger burned within him. And Terah saw the anger of the king was kindled against him, and he answered the king, saying, All that I have is in the king's power. Whatever the king desires to do to his servant, that let him do. Yes, even my son, he is in the king's power. Without value in exchange, he and his two brothers that are older than he. And the king said to Terah, No, but I will purchase your younger son for a price. <clears throat> and Terah answered the king, saying, I beseech you, my master and king, to let your servant... I'm sorry, let your servant speak a word before you and let the king hear the word of his servant. And Terah said, let my king give me three days time till I consider this matter within myself and consult with my family concerning the words of my king. And he pressed the king greatly to this. And the king hearkened to Terah and he did so and he gave him three days time and Terah went out from the king's presence. And he came home to his family and spoke to them all the words of the king and the people were greatly afraid. And it was in the third day that the king sent to Terah, saying, Send me your son for a price, as I spoke to you. And you sh and should you not do this, I will send and slay all that you have in your house, that you shall not even have a dog remaining. And Terah hastened, as the thing was urgent from the king, and he took the child from one of his servants, which his handmaid had borne him to that day. And Terah brought the child to the king and received valley for him. And Yahweh was with Terah in this manner, that Nimrod might not cause Abram's death. And the king took the child from Terah, and with all his might dashed his head to the ground, for he thought it had been Abram. And this was concealed from him from that day, and it was forgotten by the king, as it was the will of the providence the will of providence not to suffer Abram's death. And Terah took Abram his son secretly together with his mother and nurse, and he concealed them in a cave, and he brought them their provisions monthly. And Yahweh was with Abram in the cave, and he grew up, and Abram was in the cave ten years. And the king and his princes, soothsayers and sages, thought that the king had killed Abram. <clears throat> Excuse me <clears throat> for a second. All right, uh, what do I have here? Okay. And Haran, the son of Terah, Abram's oldest brother, took a wife in those days. Let's see. Let's We can skip some of this. Mm. No, we, should, we need to read it. And Haran, the son of Terah, Abram's oldest brother, took a wife in those days. Haran was 39 years old when he took her. And the wife of Haran conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Lot. And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and she called her name Milcah. And she again conceived and bare a daughter, and she called her name Sarai. Haran was 42 years old when he begot Sarai, which was in the, the tenth year of the life of Abram. In those days, Abram and his mother and nurse went out from the cave, as the king and his subjects had forgotten the affair of Abram. And when Abram came out from the cave, he went to Noah and his son Shem, and he remained with them to learn the instructions of Yahweh and his ways. And no man knew where Abram was, and Abram served Noah and Shem, his son, for a long time. 
And Abram was in Noah's house 39 years, and Abram knew Yahweh from three years old, and he went in the ways of Yahweh until the day of his death, as Noah and his son Shem had taught him. And all the sons of the earth in those days greatly transgressed against Yahuwah, and they rebelled against him, and they served other Elohim, and they forgot Yahuwah, who, was, who created them in the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth made unto themselves at that time every man his God, or his Elohim, Elohims of wood and stone, which could neither speak, hear, nor deliver, and the sons of men served them, and they became Elohim, their Elohim. <clears throat> and the king and all his servants, and Terah with all his household, were then the first of those that served Elohim of wood and stone. And Terah had twelve Elohim of large size, made of wood and stone, after the twelve months of the year. And he served each one monthly, and every month Terah would bring his meat offering and drink offering to his Elohim. Thus did Terah all the days. And all that generation were wicked in the sight of Yahuwah, and thus they made every man his Elohim. But they forsook Yahuwah who had created them. And there was not a man found in those days in the whole earth who knew Yahuwah, for they served each man his own Elohim, except Noah and his household, and all those who were under his counsel knew Yahuwah in those days. And Abram the son of Terah was waxing great in those days in the house of Noah, and no man knew it, and Yahuwah was with him. And Yahuwah gave Abram an understanding heart, and he knew all the works of that generation were vain, and that all their Elohim were vain and were of no avail. And Abram saw the sun shining upon the earth, and Abram said unto himself, Surely now this sun that shines upon the earth is Elohim, and I will serve him. And Abram served the sun in that day, and he prayed to him, and when the evening came, the sun set as usual, and Abram said within himself, Surely this cannot be Elohim. And Abram still continued to speak within himself, Who is he who made the heavens and the earth? Who created upon the earth? Where is he? And night darkened over him, and he lifted up his eyes toward the west and north and south and east, and he saw that the sun had vanished from the earth, and the day became dark. And Abram saw the stars and the moon before him, and he said, Surely this is the Elohim who created the whole earth as well as man. And behold, these his servants are Elohim around him. And Abram served the moon and prayed to it all night. And in the morning when it was light and the sun shone upon the earth as usual, Abram saw all these things that Yahweh Elohim had made upon the earth. <clears throat> And Abram said unto himself, Surely these are not Elohim that made the earth and all mankind, but these are the servants of Elohim. And Abram remained in the house of Noah, and there knew Yahuwah in all his ways. And he served Yahuwah all the days of his life. And all that generation forgot Yahuwah, and served other Elohim of wood and of stone, and rebelled in their days. And the king Nimrod reigned securely, and all the earth was under his control, and all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. And all the princes of Nimrod and his great men took counsel together, Put Mitzrayim, Cush, and Canaan with their families. And they said to each other, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and in it make a strong tower, and its top reaching heaven, and we will make ourselves famed, so that we may reign upon the whole world, in order that e the evil of our enemies may cease from us, and that we may reign mightily over them, and that we may, may not become scattered over the whole the earth on our account of their wars. And they all went before the king, and they told the king these words, and the king agreed with them in this affair, and he did so. And all the families assembled, consisting of about 600,000 men, and they went to seek an extensive piece of ground to build a city and a tower. And they sought in the whole earth, and they found none like the valley at the east of the land of Shinar, about two days' walk. And they journeyed there, and there they dwelt. And they began to make bricks and burn fires to build a city, sorry, to build the city and the tower, and they imagined to complete and the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin, and they began to build it. And whilst they were building against, <clears throat> and while they were building against Yahweh of Elam of heaven, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. And all these people and all the families divided themselves in three parts. The first said, "We will ascend into heaven and fight against him." The second said, "We will ascend to heaven and place our own Elohim there and serve them." And the third part said, "We will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears." And Elohim knew all their works and all their evil thoughts, and he saw the city and the tower with which they were building. And when they were building, they built themselves a great city and a very high and strong tower. And on account of its height, the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent to it until those who went up had completed a full year. And after that, they reached the builders and gave them the mortar and bricks, and thus it was done daily. And behold, these ascended, and others descended the whole day. And if a brick should fall from their hands to get broken, they would all weep over it. And if a man fell and died, none of them would look at him. And Yahweh knew their thoughts, and it came to pass, when they were building, building they cast <clears throat> the arrows towards the heaven, and all the arrows fell upon them, filled with blood. And when they saw them, they said to each other, Surely we have slain all those who are in heaven. For this was from Yahweh in order to cause them to err, and in order to destroy them from off the face of the ground.
And they built a tower in the city, and they did this thing daily until many days were elapsed. And Elohim said to the seventy angels who stood foremost before to him, to those who were, who were near to him, we learn about them in Psalm 82, the council of Elohim, saying, Come, let us descend and confuse their tongues, that, no, that, that one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto them. And from that day following, they forgot each man his neighbor's tongue, and they could not understand to speak in one tongue. And when the builder took off from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone or which they did not order, the builder would cast it away and throw it upon his neighbor that he would die. And they did so many days, and they killed many of them in this manner. Let me pause here real quick. The Targums read, uh, And Yahuwah said to the seventy angels which stand before him, Come, we will descend, and we will there commingle their language, that a man shall not understand the speech of his neighbor. <clears throat> And the word of Yahuwah was revealed against the city, which we know as Messiah, was revealed against the city and with him 70 angels having reference to the 70 nations, each having his own language. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, Jasher uh, 935. And Yahuwah smote the three divisions that were there, and he punished them according to their works and designs. Those who said, we will ascend to heaven and serve our Elohim became like apes and elephants. Whoa. And those who said, we will smite the heaven with arrows, Yahuwah killed them. One man through the hand of his neighbor, and the third division of those who said, We will ascend to heaven and fight against him. Yahweh scattered them throughout the earth. And those who were left amongst them, when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building, and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And they ceased building the city and, uh, and the tower. Therefore he called the place Babel, for there Yahweh confounded the language of the whole earth. And behold, it was in the east in the land of Shinar. And as the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part thereof. And a fire also descended from heaven and burned up another third, and the other third is left to this day. And it is that of it is that part of which uh, which was aloft, and its circumference is three days' walk. And many of the sons of men died in that tower, a people without number. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to stop there. And um, yeah, one thing I want to mention: it, it seems like um, Abram married his um, his daughter's his father's daughter, so his sister. It says here, And Terach took Avram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, uh, his son Avram's woman, and they went forth. So, uh, yeah, okay. So if we, we learn here, um, Sarai, the name of Nahor's woman, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah. So Haran um, was um, Avram's brother. So he married his brother's daughter, which would be his niece, we learn that here in Jasher. <clears throat> Haran, the son of Terah, Abram's oldest brother, took a wife in those days. Haran was 39 years old when he took her. And the wife of Haran conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Lot. And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and she called her name Milcah. And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and she called her name Sarai. So this would, Sarai would be his niece, not his sister. So anyways, uh, with that being said, this Torah portion is completed. I pray that in some way might have been a blessing for you. Um, let's pray together. Father Yahweh Most High, we just come before you and present ourselves before you as an assembly. Father, thank you for your word and allowing us to grow. Thank you for sending your son Messiah that we may have forgiveness in life. And Father, we just ask that you continue to help us that we may bear fruit and that we may be found ready and, and, and obedient and faithful when Messiah Yahushua comes back. In Yahushua's mighty name we do pray. Amen and hallelujah. Blessings to you, brothers and sisters. We'll do a... Uh, a song and uh, considering we just read um, about how uh, the idolatry back in those days we'll, we'll do uh, left and right ministries O Israel and we'll complete this uh, Torah portion. Blessings to you. Shabbat Shalom I pray the rest of your Shabbat is amazing or whenever you're listening to this. Shalom in our soul that long to know our great Adon as we wander in the wilderness we lift our cry up to receive his rest who is our Elohim oh his voice is calling Alone, oh, he's right.
wrestling in our soul The long to know our great adorn As we wander in the wilderness We lift our cry up to receive His breath Who is our Elohim? Oh, His voice is calling Who gave his one and only son To make us free and forgiven Oh, we praise, we praise the hell of Yaakov We praise the hell of Yaakov Who was and is and is to come We praise the hell of Yes. 
upon me and give you peace. Yahuwah, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you.